Let's go. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another, shall I say, episode. <laughs> These things are becoming episodes just like that. Welcome to another episode, another session of navigating close quarter relationships. Now, um, for those who would have seen the flyers being promoted, you'd have seen the lockdown series, and that's because this was sort of birthed um, when this whole lockdown business began. And we envision that this will be a time where many relationships will be challenged and the hope or the goal was to equip, to strengthen, to establish marriages um, and relationships within families as well. And that's why we are here today. So over the past few weeks, we've had panel sessions. We started initially with an amazing set of teaching sessions by Pastor Bio. They were just legit, amazing. And then we went to some panel sessions and this is our third week of the panel sessions. And this week I am delighted to invite our amazing guests. Um, I'm just gonna hand over to Sho so Sho can say who the guests are for today. Yes, so we have the one and only Pastor Adebayo or Pastor Eugene Adebayo Ajayi. We have <laughs> Sylvester and Mamesi Williams. <laughs> <laughs> we have Mr. Ni nee Ayeni. <laughs> and we have Sho and Mo Carter Daniel. <laughs> Right. So thank you. That was really good. Right. So every weapon fashioned against my share right now will not prosper. Amen. Okay. So first question on Slido, just because this thing's misbehaving, is this. Should married folk seek marriage advice from single friends? Should married folk seek ad um, marriage advice from single friends? Um, I don't know who'd like to take this one first. Mm -hmm. Um, who would like to go for it? Mm. I think I'll, I'll try and answer that one. I think it depends on the source. Um, because, you know, s some single people can, you know, they can impart wisdom. Um, not to say that they're inexperienced. They may have had good and bad experiences which they can share. Um, and they may, they may point out things that you may not have seen or noticed. Um, and so, yeah, you can't totally rule it out, but you also have to kind of like understand the, you know, where it's coming from. Um, and it may not necessarily be a friend that may give you advice either. Um, so I think very much, I think you need to pay attention to the source. Um, I think that's the most important thing. Um, and also where it's coming from. Um, also as well, it depends on the, the stuff they talk about, whether it's negative or positive, um, because they may give you the negative and the positive in equal measure. So it's something that you probably have to use discernment, some kind of spiritual discernment in terms of, you know, what you take on board. So I think, yeah, very much the source and spiritual discernment is key. Um, and, and that's not just with single people as well. It could also be, come from married people. Um, the source and spiritual discernment is very key in that instance because, you know, it depends. Um, some people have their own agenda as well. So that's something you be, need to be mindful of, I feel. Absolutely. The only thing I'd add to that is, um, you know, God can use anybody. So um, like Sly said, it doesn't really necessarily matter whether they're single or not. Um, I think you need to be open that God can use anybody. It could be someone that you've never met before, you know, mm. a passerby. Um, yeah. But yeah, discernment um, and understanding, um, you know, what they're actually saying um, is really very key. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm going to look at it this way. You know, there are two types of knowledge. One is experiential, experiential knowledge, the one you mm. get um, by experiencing something and revelation and knowledge. Mm. So, um, a young man or a single who has built up himself for 10 years, for the last 10 years, not just studying books, not just observing people, but also learning from God, understanding the Holy Spirit, mm. um, will be in a better position to advise you. Okay, so if he knows what married folks don't know, 
then mm. his advice is going to be 100% legit. Mm. So um, it doesn't mean that he himself, when he gets to that position, he wouldn't make that mistake, but he knows. So he knows better. So when he gets there, mm. it's not going to. He will be better informed. He's well informed to navigate his course. So mm. um, the reason why people say, oh, you, you're not married, you can't advise me, is because they're like, you don't, you, you don't have the experience. When you are there, mm. <laughs> you don't know how you're going to react. But if, if we understand that the Holy Spirit can inspire someone or yeah. someone can build up himself, whether he or she has experienced it or not, but yes, that person can be in a better position mm. to respond to even complex situations that you know, they haven't experienced. Yeah. I, agree. yeah, I agree. I mean, like everyone has sort of said, it's important and we can't um, shut anyone down just because of their marital status. Mm. Um, and as we've mentioned, we need to be discerning. We need to um, well, think about what it is that we're actually saying. Um, and I think the only thing I would probably add to it is balance. Mm. Um, it's important to seek balance when speaking with anyone at all, whether married or single. Um, and the truth is, and I'm not saying anyone is wrong at all, but the truth is there are certain things that as much as we may know in theory, having it in experience actually adds a bit of you know, to the meal, just makes it a bit um, sweeter. You have more perspective on different matters. So should married folks seek marriage advice from single friends? Um, ideally, I would say seek marriage advice from those who are married, particularly those who are um, experienced as well. However, like me said, people have wisdom. I have single friends who have more knowledge <laughs> about the way a marriage should be from God's perspective than certain single friends, um, than certain married friends right now. So some single friends who have more knowledge than those who are actually married and so yeah, we can't disqualify anyone. We can't discount anyone, but it's important to seek balance by maybe speaking mm -hmm. still as well to someone who is married as well. Just yeah. to things up, see different perspectives. <clears throat> I agree. Yeah, I'll just say that um, truth, is to, um, truth is not hinged upon whether the person is married or not. Um, yeah. Truth really is, depend is dependent on what is hinged. It's all hinged on God. And um, if we say that... Um, single friends cannot give advice, then I guess we shouldn't listen to Paul. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, think, I think at the same time, though, that this is not to disregard the fact that um, experiential knowledge is definitely um, richer in, in you know, um, because, I mean, for example, you know, I think for, for some of us that used to listen to rap, we would, we would um, listen to the rappers that have lived, they're actually rapping what they live basically, as opposed to the rappers that just say they've got this, they've got that, but, you know, they're, they're, they're soft guys. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, you know, truth, oh, I think what we should really think about is just um, like what Sylvester said earlier is, is this person speaking truth that's, that's based upon Christ, who is truth itself, itself. Um, if what this person is actually saying is true and it's based upon God and it's a thing that is in line with his will, such as, you know, seeking peace, um, seeking unity, um, love, those mm -hmm. things. If it's based, if it's hinged upon those, mm -hmm. then we should take up, we should take up that thing. You know, I mean, if it changes someone to to, to, to make peace, the Bible says, you know, um, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. You know, so like just those sort of things. If it's hinged upon truth, then we should take that, irrespective. Awesome. So that was our first question. Should married folks seek marriage advice from single friends? And I personally think it has been answered excellently well. Um, mind you guys, if you have any questions, please ask um, the questions that just come up. Mm -hmm. The questions from last week. So ask your questions. Um, like, I'll start asking now so we can answer it um, before the end of today's session. So next question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will read this one with my chest. Just, just yeah. <laughs> so, do women find it harder to apologize than men? And is it right to apologize during a disagreement when you're not culpable just to keep the peace? Like, do women find it easy, well, find it harder to right. apologize? <laughs> and is it right to just say, oh yeah, I'm sorry, just to keep the peace? What do you guys think? 
Well, that's for the ladies to, to answer this question. No, Let's see. no doubt. Mo, you know, what do you think? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so just leave it to them. We'll leave it to them and then just sit back. Sit back, sit back. Okay. Microphone. <laughs> go for it, my messy. Go on, go on. What do you think? What do you think, Mo? What do you think? I, I, I asked the question. So, you know, I'm going to love my sister as I love myself, yeah? And I'm going to pass it on to my messy. Go for it, sis. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Messi. She loves you. She really loves you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, mm, I think it's I think it just depends on the type of person. I don't know if it's specific to gender. Um, maybe the guys will have a different view. Um, I don't think I don't think women find it harder. I don't think it's I don't think it's dependent on gender. I think it's just a, a, as a person. Some people do find it harder to say sorry than others, regardless of whether it's a man or woman. That's what I think. Mm. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's not necessarily gender-based, um, but you also have to understand the, maybe the complexity of what they're saying sorry for. So maybe it could be just, I don't know, um, cleaning the dishes or something like that. Then it's a minor. I said I was going to do it, then I didn't do it. But... Mm. Um, if it's something that's a major thing, I think that I think that both sexes have problems or issues um, actually addressing the issue of saying sorry because of the fact that there's an element of pride involved, and so when that pride is dented, it's almost like you kind of make you it makes you look makes you seem or feel inadequate um, to say sorry, and so there's a bit of pride there. So I would say. From a man's perspective, it will definitely be all about ego. Um, there may be a bit of bravado to begin with, but if you're of that disposition whereby you're able to say sorry, then it will be easy to do. Um, some people, it, it needs training. There's a training aspect to it. And when I say training, um, they, <laughs> it might be a repeated issue whereby it's almost like they've been pushed into a corner where they do have to say sorry eventually because you can't just go... Um, through a relationship without saying sorry when you know you're in the wrong. But at the same time as well, just because the other party is in the wrong and it could be male or female, doesn't necessarily mean that the party that feels they're in the right or who are right, mm. in some instances, can't say sorry either. Because I just think that that's a good way to, if you can say, to bring down the level of, uh, if you can say, um, anger, any kind of animosity even. Um, and also it diffuses the situation better when you actually come and say sorry, even, even if you're not in the wrong. That's what I've learned anyway. Um, and I think that it's a good way to start the conversation in terms of, if you can say, air your views. But that's where the diplomacy comes in, where you can actually sit down and have a conversation about it. And I think that's very important. So. I think that saying sorry actually sets up the conversation for or the dialogue between the sexes in terms of, you know, what, what the issue actually is. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily down to the sex. Um, I think as well, another aspect will be down to experience, the experience that that individual may have had, whereby they may have come from a home where they haven't really seen that. Um, or they just it's just a pride thing simple as that it's just part of their character and it's something that needs to be worked on okay so we're saying it's less of a gender issue and more of a character matter yeah essentially okay what do you think what does everyone else think oh by the way pastor bio evening yeah <clears throat> good evening I was just enjoying the, uh, the I'm drinking of the wisdom of the guys. So <laughs> I, was the <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, okay. it's good to have you on. I think Nee was going to drop um drop a few bars with regards. Yes, to what I wanted to say was um not just about apology, but how. Um, like uh, Sylvester mentioned, we need to understand that it's it's not about. Uh, gender right now it's about personality or the persona mm. okay so um when you just say okay i'm sorry full stop 
to some people, that is not apology. That's like, okay, so, I'm sorry, so, they want you to explain. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I learned this um, while I was, you know, considering my courtship that, um, you know, that when I'm apologized to, I actually want more. It's like, okay, I'm sorry. I don't feel you're really sorry. Then I started, why am I feeling this way? Then I realized that my language of apology is different. So we have different languages of apology, just like we have love languages. Yeah. Okay, some people, for you to, for them to actually accept that you're sorry, you need to go a step further or maybe explain yourself. Like, okay, um, I shouldn't have done it this way. I did this, that was wrong. Admit. Some people will apologize and tell you, but okay, they'll put but. I'm sorry, but okay. I'm sorry. However, <laughs> you, you know, but so the question is, are you really sorry? So what, what I find, what I found that is that sometimes it's not just about apologizing, but mm -hmm. apologizing the way the person wants to be apologized to that, you know, will eventually calm the fire and quench the fire. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I'm not, maybe it's even hug, like, okay, I'm sorry. I want to give you a hug and okay, yes, I'm happy. But you said, I'm sorry. And you didn't hug me. Ah. You're not really sorry. <laughs> so it, it kind of varies. So you need to like understand your language of apology. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this guy wrote it as well. Um, Gary Shapman is one of his books. Um, you know, five languages of apologies, I think. Just like, you know, five love languages. So mm -hmm. something that I would recommend for couples and also singles to, to pick up on and uh, to understand how to better apologize to one another. Awesome. Thank you. And thanks for the book recommendation as well. Yeah. Um, I think when we send out the link for the video after this, we'll send that book recommendation. So, bro, could you please send me the link for the book? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and PB, were you going to say something about this? Were you going to add anything to it? <coughs> Sorry, PB, we can't hear you. You're, you're on mute, Pastor Vial. Ah. <laughs> I was gonna say you made a great mimer there, you know, with the way this ad was. Well, it means that um, you know, um, expertise is flowing both ways. I teach you holy bars, you teach me how to rap. Wow. <laughs> wow. Anyway, so um, yeah, the the question about apologies. I would reserve my comments about the gender. Mm disparities that may, uh, may present itself when we look at the statistics, but we'll just focus on the fact that whether it's one gender or the other, I think ultimately um, it goes back to the root, which is character. Yeah. And um, so you, you guys have, have, have nailed, uh, nailed that. And I think that it's intelligence, relational intelligence will teach you that sorry, is a very important skill mm -hmm. um, in relational matters. And, and if, for the very simple reason, and in, in theory of relationships, as we um, discussed on, uh, on the broadcast yesterday, that love starts when you die. Mm -hmm. So love is actually at the point when your selfishness ends and selflessness starts. Mm -hmm. So bottom line, if you are in a relationship and it's functioning in love, you'll be able to apply the language of apology when it's necessary. Now, even if you are culpable, as that question said, in order to maintain peace, the Bible says that blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called, who can finish it? Ah, you have not been reading your scripture. The sons of God. <laughs> uh -huh. So that means even if you did it to maintain peace, it makes sense. Now, it does not mean that you should be unreasonable and say sorry when there's a matter to confront. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can say sorry for how someone feels without necessarily saying sorry for what, you know, about the situation. You get my point. If someone is upset, there are two or three issues that's at work. Mm -hmm. One is that something was wrong, okay? Or the person perceived that something was wrong Secondly, is the, past, the person feels somehow. So the wisdom is to be able to say sorry anytime, knowing that sorry doesn't mean I'm sorry because I was wrong. It's mm -hmm. first sorry because I care about your feelings enough to say I'm sorry you feel that way. 
Okay. It gives me an inroad to then um, have a conversation to find out exactly what you thought was wrong. And usually when someone knows you care about their feelings, they're usually more open, usually. There's some people, times we find the other person is not reasonable, but um, that's just something I'd like to add to that. Awesome. So sorry for, for feeling the way you feel. Can yeah. we talk about it? You know, is there something I've missed? I actually didn't realize, you know, that, I, you know, you, I had upset you. Mm. But what was let's talk about it so that at least if I know what's happening, then I can avoid it next time. And um, and what if the, you then discuss it and you still find out that you're still right? Yeah. The Bible says that love doesn't insist on its own right. So sometimes just let things go if it's not fundamental. If it is fundamental, however, find ways to take it forward. Thank you so, so, so much. Thank you so much for that. We've heard about character. We've heard about is it actually a fundamental issue? And we've also now heard that it is not a gender specific matter in terms of it being harder or easier. And I absolutely agree. Um, in terms of the second part of the question, which has also been touched on, I think the only thing I will add is that I don't think it is right to say sorry just to shut the person up. I believe it's rude. I don't think it shows any sort of respect or honor for that person. Um, it's, it's not right. Um, the Bible says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. So if you're not sorry um, for how you've made the person feel or for what you've actually done, then find another word. But we shouldn't, we shouldn't just abuse the word sorry. It means we don't really appreciate it or know what it means. So I absolutely agree with Pastor Bayo. It is possible, and I've done it many times, when I will say, I'm sorry if that made you feel this type of way. That was not my intention. Um, but because I cannot control how a person feels, that's as much as I can do. However, if I have done something wrong, I will say, do you know what? I'm sorry what I did was wrong. But sorry isn't something that we should just abuse. Are you going to add anything, B? No. No. Fantastic. So that said, let's move on to our next question. This is an interesting one. I don't know if I'm going to spend too much time on this just because of the other questions that are left. But... What are you actively doing to help your single friends meet partners? And they put a smiley face there. So yeah, Ni, what, do you, what are you doing to help your single friends meet partners? Let's start with you on this one. I mean, it's very simple. Um, most of them want, they want recommendations or they want to be match made. Oh, here's my friend, here's the contact. Um, but while I, I don't like to do that, I, I wouldn't like to do that personally. So what I would do is to introduce them to a community of Christians, like we have uh, Casey Community. And um, yeah, we have this Casey Community, amazing people. Um, you can come around, maybe you'll find someone, maybe not. So it's just in introducing them to an environment where they can find godly and uh, good people. So, but uh, matchmaking, no. So what, what I'm doing personally is in, introducing them to a community of saints uh, where they can see young people and they can, you know, mingle and anything can happen. Thank you so, so much for that. So at least we know what you're doing. You've spoken about introducing them to the right environment. Um, I think someone once mentioned that and they, they termed it strategic positioning. Yeah. So it looks like you've been helping your friends with their own... Um, shall I say strategic positioning? So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> how about you, um, um, Sylvester? Sylvester, what mm. have you been doing to help your single friends meet partners, or what can be done? So let's expand it. Apart from what are you doing, what yeah. are you actually doing? So also, what can be done? What can others do? Yeah, I think um, one of the key things that. I've done over the years in regards to just basically see where those individuals are um, in particular with the, my male friends actually find out where they are uh, mentally uh, emotionally uh, financially all that kind of stuff I can have I can have those kind of kind of you know those candid conversations with them um, and also as well just to find out you know if they are interested in potentially meeting like-minded people, um, whether male or female, um, 
Um, and also as well, you know, I've, I've introduced um, several people in terms of like Casey in the past, um, you know, um, and I think that you have to be very um, cautious as well because of the fact that you can actually scare them off um, if you go in too hard. So it's almost like you're kind of chipping away slowly over a period of time, basically to wean them in, in terms of how they, you know, they're thinking, um, because they may have like reservations because the classic response that, you know, in particular with the guys that I've spoken to has been, oh, is this a, is this a dating event kind of thing? And they come from that perspective because of the fact that um, from past experience, they've gone to events like that. And it has been like, you know, kind of like speed dating. They, they, they've they been burnt before and, the, you know, the experience hasn't been that great. And so um, they are kind of scarred from those previous experiences. So yeah. it could be a case you may, may need to work o- on them for over a period of time. Um, the other aspect is all about um, spiritual maturity. So I have quite a few guy friends that... Um, they're not spiritually mature, so I wouldn't even dare, you know, introduce them to um, a lady, for instance. But I also have friends that are very spiritually mature and they're ready. Um, but it's just a case of, well, we're in lockdown at the moment, so <laughs> might might need to be very strategic and very, um, how can I put it, savvy with that. But yeah, I mean, there's several ways of doing it, but you know. I think it's just down to um, personal preference in terms of the approach, so to speak. But I think you need to be very tactful mm. in your approach, though. Oh, that's my kind of like overall recommendation. I don't think there's any wrong or right way, um, but I think tact is very key. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for the sake of time, I think those two answers are amazing. And we're going to move on to the other questions. So, um, Someone has can, very- I say, can I say quickly? Oh yes, yes, yes. Just, yeah, just to just to help those who are on who who are still single and to give them hope that a few years ago, for those who are wondering what KC is, um, it's a community intentionally started by myself and a few people on this group to give um singles a place to meet and to develop, to develop safe relationships that can lead from hello to I do. Now, the reason why that's important is that sometimes you can introduce, the best you can do is to introduce someone to your friend, but you don't know the kind of person your friend is, their philosophy of relationship and life. Um, ideally, relationships should actually not just be something we just pick people up in society. It was supposed to be managed within a community. If we grow up the way we're supposed to grow up, you'll find someone within the community where you have the same values. Um, so, and that's why we've had some successes. We've had quite a number of marriages in the last few years. If I'm counting, probably over 17 in the last three or so years, if I'm, if I'm correct. Um, and that's just because of very intentional positioning and intentional environment creating. Uh, but going forward, um, if there are people who are single here, there's no magic in it. Um, it's just... We, there has to be some proactivity. Those who have come in and who have been able to, you know, move on and get and then get married was because there was there was involvement beyond just coming um, and speed dating and looking good, looking handsome and looking pretty. It involves a lot of work. So, like Nii said, if you want to introduce your friends to someone, you also need to provide an environment where they're going to get support as men and, and as women, and they can get support from couples also who are connected and who have been on that path so that we are all learning together because there's a science to the way you conduct yourselves um, in relationship. And what I can say is that among that community, even people who have tried once or twice to be with one or two or three people and they figured out that it didn't work out, they still went on and they got married and then the community kept together. So it's, so it also matters the environment, what I'm suggesting. But of course, we have more questions. You can ask the organizers in this group if you're single or you have single friends. Um, I will see how to um, help you on that journey. Okay, more over to you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, So next question. 
Oh, before I move to the next question, I believe everyone can see the screen, but you can ask your questions at well, slido.com and put the hashtag AskNCQR or just go to sli.do forward slash AskNCQR. So we have um, another question Ooh, that was here and I think it's kind of gone now. But we'll ask this one. It says, prior to marriage, people put their best foot forward. I'm scared after marriage, a lot is unveiled, i.e. farting, no speaking. <laughs> any, any advice? <laughs> I don't know if I should take this one first because <laughs> people put that prior to marriage, I, and you're right, yes, people do put their best foot forward prior to marriage. Who doesn't want to look good? Um, who doesn't want to look spotless and perfect? Who doesn't want to look like the perfect package? Um, but the truth is we often attract what it is that we um, put out there to people. So if you're constantly trying to put your best foot forward and you're constantly looking like you, you don't have any flaws, the person is like, and this is me talking as a lady now, the person who's likely to come to you or whenever anyone does come, the chances are they're trying to you know come up to that standard that you've set which is great however um this is where the 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 hello to i do questions come into play where you are asking questions beyond the surface you're asking about their their person the personality you're asking about about the people around them you're asking about their personas their understanding of different matters you're looking at those around them you're, you're you're not just looking at the person and what they've brought forward but you're looking at the big picture it's important to understand that any one individual is um what's the word is a cumulative picture of all the different aspects of their life their family their friends their relationship their work all of those different things make up each individual um so yes people are likely to put their best foot forward but that doesn't mean that that's all that there is um, to the picture. That doesn't mean that um, you won't find out other things if you ask the right question. And if it's in regards to farting, I'm sorry, human beings, let me stop. Even the queen farts. I say that with all respect in my heart. Um, the queen burps and it doesn't smell fresh. It doesn't smell like strawberries. So if your worry is that in marriage, someone is going to do something like fart that's would annoy you enough to walk out, then don't get married. I'm um, glad I know love, by the way, but um, let, me, let me pass it on to someone <laughs> who can help me, you know, add, add some more spice to it. I think prior to marriage, I think um, if you guys have qualitative um, conversations, I'm sure there is something that you guys could probably speak about, you know, what are your pet peeves? It's definitely something that Mom and I spoke about prior yeah. to us getting married. So when some of these things actually happened, where there we are you know it wasn't a surprise um it's just a way to kind of manage expectations mm. yeah. yeah i would echo that i would i would just say just be open and honest i yeah. mean yeah. you know there's no point in putting the veil up when you know no one no one's perfect and there are going to be certain things that the person does within the marriage that you may not like so it's just good to just lay all your cards on the table because at the end of the day um, it saves you a palaver in terms of, you know, getting some nasty surprises when you're in the marriage. So just be open and honest. That's my, that's my take on it. Um, and also in terms of, well, the ailments such as farting and all that, well, you know, <laughs> it's, all, it's all part of the territory. You're going to see a lot of things that you may not have um, envisaged in the marriage as well so it's one of those things whereby if you like the person enough and they if you can say their um their pluses you know considerably outweigh their minuses then i don't see that i don't see the issue absolutely and I, I i i love the way you've said that you just reminded me of an old saying um it's very simple it just says roses have thorns so as beautiful as a rose is, it still has thorns and it will still prick your finger and make you bleed. But it doesn't change the fact that it's still a rose. Um, mm. wow. so, so let me speak into that um, very quickly. I was going to make a joke that before Sho answered, he picked his nose and I said, aha, he picked his nose. But anyway. Wow. 
But anyway, but you see, they, when I looked at that question, of course, because it's not asked, uh, the question was not about a lot of other maybe fundamental issues. These are visceral issues that, particularly that the person who's asking the question also does the fact. Maybe they don't, they do it in the toilet, but they don't, not in the room. It's, it's the same thing. But all I'd like to mention is this, just to give you perspective. When you have a child and a baby and the baby poops on you or farts or, or drools, how do you feel about the baby? Do you get annoyed? The answer is no. Mm -hmm. So many times when you have a problem with a spouse farting, snoring, picking their nose, it's just because you have not really resolved in your mind what love means to that spouse because because you love and care for your baby even when the baby puts you like oh you baby has put this or you know so you just realize the fact that when you feel so irritated by what their body does in such a way that you actually feel like maybe knocking them on the head and knocking them out then it means you need to really work on your love muscles a little bit more mm -hmm. you have to be able to see beyond if you can see beyond the poop of a baby and still love the baby your baby you should be able to to look at beyond the fat and the no speaking of your baby, which is your big baby now, and it shouldn't be too much of a problem. But of course, if 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 it's stopped, if they, they, you can reason around the, the the way the person does. You can say, "Okay, well, if you need to do that, why don't you go into the, into the bathroom and step out afterwards, or you, or you use the or use the, this, uh, this, the deodorant that is and afterwards?" It will not be a big issue. It's something you can discuss. That's not supposed to cause a fight. Wow! Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think we have some <laughs> amazing answers <laughs> to this question. Ni, were you going to add anything to this? Is there anything you plan on unveiling after you get married? Let's help, let's, let's help your lady out so she can know from now. Um, I mean, <laughs> like PB said, like, the, the idea is really to be as real as possible. And I think if you are in the courtship, courtships uh, process or the stage, you need to observe, you need to, one skill you need is an observation skill. Exactly. So yeah. <laughs> uh, if anything catches you by surprise during, uh, after marriage, then you have not done your homework very mm. well. So observe everything, you, you notice every slightest thing, okay? Like um, the details, like what they do after they, they eat, what do they do? You know, some people still like to leave their plates behind and stuff. Mm -hmm. Why some people, so those little, little things that all, you know, I noticed that you do this. So it, it's not just about some like picking up the nose, just general things, gen, you know, notice those things and raise them and talk about them. So if you don't notice uh, no speaking during courtship and it's after marriage that you noticed it, then something is uh, technically wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And if you do find things that come after marriage, um, you can always talk about it. Absolutely. So, it. Yeah. And if it's that deep, you can seek counsel as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you so much. So next question says, whoa, in this Insta filter generation, actually, let me ask this one. Should do you want to go for this one, baby? All right. You can hold it in this Insta filter generation, how do you as a couple stay attracted to one another and how do you deal with the distractions? Hmm. Thank you, Sylvester. What do you think? <laughs> mm. Well, with the Insta filter, well, that's only uh, arm's length. So you're only viewing the person on the Insta. Gram account, but if you're seeing the person for what they are, I mean, <clears throat> let's just take it from the perspective. Well, men don't wear makeup, you know, Christian men anyway. Um, so we're obviously looking at it from the female perspective. I mean, well, personally speaking, I don't mind makeup, um, and it's one of those things whereby I think that to bring out a late a woman's features. Yeah wear makeup, that's cool. But if it's plastered on whereby you have to get a hammer and chisel, then there's an issue there. There's obviously an issue with maybe self-esteem. Um, and um, yeah, there could be underlying um, issues in regards to kind of like confidence and stuff like that. Um, personally speaking, it's like, it's something that you probably have to embrace and maybe get to the bottom of it in terms of asking the right questions. Um, 
in terms of, let's say, for instance, when you're looking at it from a social media perspective, people put filters on anyway. It's always like the kind of like, if you can say the default default mechanism whereby it's almost like, yeah, I need to look nice on this account and stuff like that. Well, that's the generation we're in. Um, but personally speaking, you know, you meet this person face to face. It's almost like you what, what you see is what you get. Um, it's either take it or leave it. Um, and also as well, it could be just a case of, you know, giving them a boost to their confidence, actually talking to them about it, find out what it actually is that, you know, makes them feel as though they're not, they don't feel beautiful on the outside. Obviously it's something that's a manifestation of what's going on inside. So you probably have to kind of delve in a bit deeper in that regard. Um, but I think with this question, it, mm -hmm. it, it, you can dissect it into two, the kind of social media element that's completely so, you know, separate. Um, and then you've got like, the actual person themselves, the real person what's actually going on there. And that's something that obviously, you know, it's up to you as a person to find what that, find out what that actually is. Awesome. Thank you so, 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 so much for that. Um, mm -hmm. I think for myself and show in this Insta filter generation, how do we as a couple stay attracted to one another and deal with the distraction? I think the first thing for us is that we, we're very open and transparent about what we think are distractions and we, we acknowledge the distractions as distractions. Like we will say that's a distraction. Um, we've come to an agreement where we, yeah, anything, anything that comes up, we will tell each other and be like, okay, there's a distraction here. Let's slash it out. And we've just been able to recognize it. Um, and I think being intentional about what's the word? appreciating, cherishing, mm. um, caring about, submitting to for me, loving, respecting um, him, put him in the, in the pedestal of my heart, in my heart that he needs to be, um, and fearing God, I think are probably some of the things I would say help us from my perspective. What do you think? Yeah, I would just say that um, distractions, okay, let me start again. I think as you mature in the faith and you progress in life, there are just certain things that won't even um, distract you. You not even distract you, but you'd have your your mind on things on, on bigger things. If that makes sense, things of greater value. I think when you spend too much time on Instagram, then it might be a, it, it may actually be a, a genuine problem. That's not to speak down on anyone that spends a lot of their time on Insta, but it may actually genuinely be a problem because. You realize, you know, oh, just, you, just, you just swipe up and down, right and left to look at different photos. You leave yourself vulnerable to comparison. You leave yourself vulnerable to picking, okay, well, this person looks like this, um, et cetera. Um, Instagram is a fantastic tool for connecting and, you know, sharing, you know, what's going on in your life and stuff like that. However, um, when you actually focus on your spouse, you leave yourself and, and, you, and you determine in your mind and you train your mind and your heart that, I am attracted to this woman that she is absolutely stunning. She is absolutely beautiful. And I have my eyes on no one but her. And you tell you, and you have a mind like Job where it says, I made the covenant with my eyes not to look upon, a, um, look upon um, any woman with lust, for example. Like those are the things that, um, that keep you away from such distractions. It's the stuff that actually helps you to stay attracted to your spouse. Now, um, this is not to say that there are certain preferences mm. that one may have. That one, you can speak to your spouse about that. I can work on that and cultivate that together, but also look at why you have that attraction. Like, what is it that um, has uh, defined that as a attraction, if that makes sense for you? And you can work through that together. So I think it's just basically just focusing on the things that matters the most. Mm -hmm. um, keeping your hands busy with things that actually contribute to your future and not just your future but those that come after you that you may not even be able to see um when you focus on those things instagram and all those things you want it, it won't even be a thing to even think about you it will be right it'll be more like a thing of just checking up on once in a while but not something like i must grab my phone and check insta to stay in touch with the culture and stuff like that so yeah, yeah. Mm. Keep your, I, keep your I should be sorry, PB. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so I think there are two ways to answer this, and depends. I don't know what type of people are on the call today. So, there's 
I'll answer it from the perspective of someone who is a Christian, which means someone who walks from their person and their spirit. Um, is that that question, how do we keep attracted to one another, is a question that will bother us when we're still in Babylon. Because um, when we are in the world, the only way we see one another, our primary way is that we see each other as, um, um, we see each other physically. So our physical attraction is what defines our relationship. But really, we know we're not just bodies walking around. And in fact, for, for married couples, you know that it's not every time in the day you're walking around with a sexual urge anyway. Um, if, that was, if that was the case, then that would be a problem, isn't it? So usually that attraction is very momentary. And often after you've done the thing you need to do, it has gone. <laughs> so in the time that it has gone, what has kept you together are things that are more internal and more intrinsic. And I think uh, Mo, you mentioned some of those things. You mentioned things like put them on the pedestal in your mind and stuff like that in your heart. So it's, it's the mind posture that matters the most. So let's say there's attraction in the body, there's connection in the heart, how you're connected to the person, what place is that person in your heart. And um, thirdly, is the devotion to God. Um, but let's put the devotion to God as, as I let's look at it, how it affects you as a human being. I'll say, first of all, as a spirit to spirit person, you know the person you are with has intrinsic worth that never diminishes. That requires faith. So if you remember who you are, that the person you are with is another human spirit and God loves them as much as they love you, that should be the basis of your relationship with a person, whether male or female. Secondly, you then must do the hard work of realizing that you're in that person's life to do them good. So because you want to do them good, you put them on the pedestal in your heart. Then on the physical plane, when you get there at night or in the morning and you feel like doing something, you do what you need to do. If you don't feel like doing something, you still do what you need to do. It then becomes something that you offer because it's part of your service to that person. So attraction doesn't really count. Love counts. Now, does it mean your body doesn't get the whole hormones thing? You can get it, but whether you get it or not, that's not what determines your relationship. So I guess it's just think about reformatting your mind. Now, if you think in this way, it will actually preserve you from distractions. So that's why Job can say, I made the covenant with my eyes. What made him make that covenant is that one, in his heart, he fears God. Number two, the intrinsic worth of his wife. Number three, because he understands his role in that relationship, he's able to make the right mind adjustment. Number four, his body is a slave. He tells the body what to do. Um, I hope that's useful for someone. Very, very useful. Most useful. And I think, um, yeah. I mean, if you have any further questions, or if anyone has any further questions about that, please ask. Um, let's move on. And I would just say to our speakers, um, for the sake of time, because I want us to be able to answer as many questions as possible, um, I would like us to, if you can, give as precise answers as possible. Like, yeah, you guys know what I mean anyway. So I will actually ask this question I think has been highlighted. I think it's back on when we had the, que the question on um, apologies. And the person has said, going back to the apologies, how do you ensure you're not just walking on eggshells or modifying your behavior to accommodate someone's comfort slash sensitivity. What do you think? How do you ensure you're not just walking on eggshells or modifying your behavior to accommodate someone's comfort slash sensitivity? I'll take that very quickly. Um, couples need a strategy to have conversations from the mundane to the difficult. Okay. So if that kind of strategy is in, in place where a couple are able to review from time to time how they're managing their relationships, that will sort it out. But if that is not in place, particularly if you have a dominant, if the other person is a dominant personality, you will struggle um, with that, except you want to uh, reach out for arbitration from someone who is um, external to you, who can help you. Um, so yeah, because someone who's asking this question I'm, so, I'm thinking they're not in a position to actually start a conversation and get things resolved. So the person may need some sort of help. Mm. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have anything they'd like to add to that? I would just add, I'm just looking at the word eggshells and it kind of 
looks like it comes from a place of maybe kind of I won't say fear, but um, it seems to be coming from that that space. Um, and I think after you've had a conversation, well, assuming they've had a conversation about maybe an issue where one party was maybe not happy with the other party. Um, after that conversation, I think you should be in a space where you can um, understand what the you know which what the sensitivities are of each individual, what behaviours um, they recognise in you that. Uh, or recognizing themselves that you know maybe is not really acceptable in terms of um, future dialogue or um, kind of interacting with each other in the future and so you should be at a place where you are able to comfortably maybe I wouldn't say I think there is a level of adapting because you know you're constantly being refined um, as you grow in Christ and you're not the perfect article so there are going to need to be some levels of change but I think not to a place where it kind of suppresses you as a person um, or in terms of your character um, beyond what I think is um, acceptable. And I think you'd understand that in just in terms of, you know, what you see as, you know, um, what things are pointed out to you, what you think is right and what is maybe, um, you know, unreasonable. And so they shouldn't, you shouldn't have that. So if you're having that, um, either like Pastor Bice said, you haven't had that conversation of understanding how to resolve issues or maybe when you've had the conversation it hasn't really um, been fully had um, and so there are still kind of some areas which are maybe haven't been fully discussed and therefore you feel that you are having to walk in eggshells rather than to be kind of open and either think that I do need to adjust my um, behaviour or um, you know they understand that you know that's how um, you know I am at times and, and, and it's accepted. I think there's a give and take on both sides and it's understanding whether that's been fully understood by both parties or not. Mm. Mm. I, I just want to add to that as well. So um, if I look at the question, I think that, yeah, there could be borderline bullying um, because, you know, the thing is that when people look at bullying, they see it from a perspective, it's intimidation but it may not necessarily be physical intimidation. It could be just intimidation by body language or the certain things a person may say, but may be said in a very soft way. But, you know, there's a, a particular undertone, under, you know, there's an undertone behind it. And so it's one of those things I would say that this kind of question, I would say whoever wrote it, it's definitely one for mediation because I think that, or first and foremost, conversation between the two parties. If that can't be addressed, then, then for mediation. Yeah, absolutely. And just, just adding as well to what's already been said, um, it, I, I sort of see a picture where um, emotions have not yet been handled. And I'm talking on the path of the person who feels like they're having to walk on eggshells. And let me just say, I can even speak from a place of experience here, because I have had times where I found that I'm having to walk on eggshells um, just to, you know, avoid conflict, as they say, just to make sure, you know, this person just spark off and just explode. And, and in those times, I really had to challenge myself and just, first of all, try and deal with the emotion behind the situation within me, change what is within my control, change what I actually can handle before now trying to go and have a conversation. Um, and it's a principle that I personally hold on to. I'll say to myself, Terrell, let go of the emotion behind the situation. If you have not, keep your mouth shut or go and find somebody to help you speak. But don't just hold on to your own emotions, hold on to your own sensitivity, um, hold on to your own perspective and assume that this is exactly how the other person is acting and so you're going to modify yourself for the other person. No, check yourself first and then let's go with everything else that has been said. But I always say, look, look, look in the mirror first. Always look in the mirror first. Mm. Um, so yeah, does anyone have anything else they'd like to add to last question? I know we have a few more questions. Wow. And we have 30 minutes to go. So and any other inputs on that? No, I think you nailed it. I think the, um, that, that actually is an insight that I think everybody can take away, which is if you are feeling that the other person is feeling one way, maybe looking deeper in yourself and adjusting your own um, perspective and approach to the issue can definitely help you in then having the conversations because sometimes when um, Sly was speaking I was just thinking that whoever is displaying the bullying language sometimes quote unquote may actually be protecting themselves from being bullied you know I'm you know my point so sometimes the person who mm -hmm. feels they are right on eggshells 
could actually be projecting a negativity where the other person actually is fences up. You know what I mean? So it could be both ways. So, but I think, um, um, Mojai, you, you did bring that balance because then if you feel like you're not able to communicate, maybe if you adjust your own emotional um, arsenal and, and, you, and you calm things down, you might actually find another approach to open up a conversation and the person may find um, they may actually be more reasonable than they appear to be. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you very much for that, Pastor Bayon. Thank you, Sylvester. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. And I believe the next question is, in this time of singleness, which is a blessing, how does someone really mentally prepare oneself um, in the transition from I to us? So in this time of singleness, which is a blessing, how does someone really mentally prepare oneself in the transition from I to us? I love this question. Um, who'd like to go first? Me, you can. Maybe you'll put it. I'll open it so that I can give context. I'll say so that I, I want to be brief. Yes. If you understand the purpose of the us you're getting into, it will let you know what you need to prepare for. Yes. So if you know that you, you want to be an engineer, then you know you can then study, you can then find out what kind of courses you need to do. So understanding what that us was meant for and what it could look like is the best preparation because then you can then seek counsel and knowledge and information on how to prepare yourself. Over to you, Sean. Wow. wow. Thank, no, you, I was just, uh, thank you very much, people. I was just, I was just saying, um, me, yes. Me, yes. Yeah, yeah, I was just gathering my thoughts there. I never expected uh, PB to be that short and precise. <laughs> Most said, wow. Me, you see me after the, see me after the event. <laughs> So I was still kind of like preparing my thoughts and everything. All right. So the first thing I'm going to say is this. Um, I to us is really powerful. And talking about accountability, being accountable, um, you surround yourself with people. And not just any other people, with godly people. Surround you, be in a community that will enforce you that will require you to not be alone, not to be, you know, not to hide, you know. So you need to be able to express yourself, check up on people. Like what we do in, in the community, we have King's Tribe, we, ha we have um, the accountability groups. We encourage ourselves to call one another, to deal with issues, to address issues. If you're struggling with one thing or the other, you want to be able to speak and say it. Uh, doing that, you prepare your mind because the question is, how do you prepare yourself mentally? So you do that and understanding what it means to be in a relationship, understanding what it means to be in a relationship. What does it take? Sacrifice. What do I need to do? Um, now I'm thinking if I'm going to be in a relationship, I don't think about myself. I think about us. And what does it entail for me to think about us? Do I need to inform the other party about my plans? Do we need to do things together? I'm going to be much more sacrificial. I need to be able to give and not just receive. I need to be able to do so many things. So um, I would say putting yourself in a community that will foster that kind of mindset is key. And it will open the doors to every other thing that, you know, your development in terms of your person in Christ, your identity in Christ, and <clears throat> becoming a man the building your manhood as well, like becoming a man after Christ, understanding what it means to be a father, husband, a lover, which you will not find if you are staying alone. So putting yourself in the right community will foster that mental transition, um, I think. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Sylvester, you gonna add? Yeah, that was, a, that was a pretty comprehensive answer, but I would, to say in terms of um, my own experience um, as a man, I think that one of the key things was what, what, what is actually, a, what, what is a man as opposed to a male? And so when I came uh, and I met Pastor B, he kind of broke that down for me. Um, but one of the things that I had a revelation of is um, what did Adam do? in the garden. So the first thing that he, he did as a man was he actually was, he, he was actually working. God, 
God made him work. And so he was actually, you know, operating within his calling. And that was to um, mine the garden. And so that was one of the first things that, that was the first thing that Adam had to do. The other aspect of being a man and is, is also being able to cultivate. So cultivate means to bring the best out of. And so if you look at it from the perspective of, are you a cultivator um, being a man? Um, well, to bring the best out of something is not just in a woman, it's also in everything you put your hands to. So coming to that understanding is very important. The other aspect is vision. You as a man, do you have a vision that you can share with somebody and potentially as a help meet, this woman can feed into that vision and help you accomplish it. Also, the other aspects, when you're in the relationship, being able to cultivate. So obviously you're not going to get the perfect vessel in terms of the woman or the person you're about to marry or who you're married to. But you as a man is meant, to, as a cultivator, is meant to bring the best out of that person. So then you can present her back to yourself and say, yeah, this is the article, this is the finished article. And for you to have that mindset, you have to be spiritually mature. And so that in itself is a journey. And so if you're not in that space, you have to work towards it. Otherwise, you're wasting your time getting into a relationship. It would just be like any other relationship because you have to understand that this person you're meeting is potentially your help meet. And if you come with that mindset, then you have to be mentally prepared. And I think that this time of singleness, there's this whole you know, hoopla about oh, being single, it's like a disease almost. It's, that's how it's personified. But this is the perfect time to actually grow spiritually speaking, you know, delve into the word, by all means, have fellowship with like-minded people and people that will edify you as well. People that will speak wisdom into your life. That is very key. So you have to also be very, very, very picky about who you surround yourself with. I think that's very important. That will help in terms of the maturity process, spiritually speaking, which is the key aspect of this. Absolutely. Thank you. Let me just add something very quickly to that, to what the gentleman said um, that will apply to both. So I think there's been emphasis on um, learning, of understanding the purpose, and they've spoken more from a man's perspective, but I'm just gonna put something more in the general perspective, that also blesses ladies. Um, once when I had a group of the uh, ladies together um, in one of our Kingdom Connections conversation, um, I challenged them this way, and it, this also goes to men. Relationship in marriage is relationship at close quarters. So if we break it down to what it is, it's close quarters relationship. I have a lot of people who are single who have not actually had very, very um, um, intense um, let me, I don't want to use it in one sense. Let's, let's say they have not actually been at close quarters meaningfully with any, anybody before. Because when you're a child, you know, you're not really under pressure. And then you go to university and you've actually not experienced close quarters relationship with mature people. So remember then I said to the ladies, I said, if you can spend 40 days in the same house with the same lady, another lady, and utilize the same, I use the same kitchen and bathroom, and you don't fight, then you are likely going to succeed in marriage. <laughs> you know, because the thing is, being with a man is not as complex as living with another lady. So that's just really, I'm saying, stretch yourself in, in those areas. And for you gentlemen also, you want to see what it's like, you know, to, to serve another person um, who is your equal, you know. So you want to put yourself in place where you practice and ex probably to, the, to an extreme so that you break those things in you that can be a barrier um, when you marry. So you want to practice how to live as an us. Start looking at those elements. Don't join those people who want to. The only thing they want to practice is to go out and find out they're compatible sexually. And I don't know what skill there is in sex, but it's about really learning how to be with other people in, in, a, in the context of close quarters relationship and still be able to live above your emotions and provide value. That may actually require some practice yeah. to establish some of the things that the gentleman has mentioned. Thank you so, so, so much. Do you know what? You've all nailed it. And thanks, Fasper, for bringing in the other perspective um, that the sisters can also hold on to.
I'll just add and say there is only so much mental preparation that can be made. Um, so I don't want anyone thinking I can prepare 100% before I go from I to us. It's a journey. Um, us is a journey. You keep learning on learning, relearning every single day. And as far as I'm concerned, that's the rice on the stew of marriage. That's the stew on the rice of marriage. You keep learning. You never stop. Um, so the transition from I to us is a journey that you continue. And that's why we have navigating from hello to I do. But then we have navigating from I do to we do. Um, and that takes an entire lifetime. They say marriage is the only um, course where you get your certificates before you actually start the, <laughs> the degree itself, um, or you start learning. So yes, thank you all so much for that. Um, we have a couple more questions, well, a few more. Um, I don't think we will be able to realistically cover everything today, um, but I think we should cover um, a few more. I think we'll probably take one more question I'll probably take one more question. Let's see. Wow. I don't know which one to do. Let's, let's answer this one, the next question, actually. It says, I had some trauma in my childhood around sexual abuse. I'm currently dating someone and it is going well. I want to be able to share this, but not sure I should. I think we will take this question um, and it will end on this question for today. And then next week, start um, with other questions so who would like to go first i had some trauma in ch my childhood um oh what have i done sorry i had some trauma in my childhood and let's put this back beautiful where, where have i put it sorry let me read the question again <laughs> yeah yeah well thank you um around sexual abuse I'm currently dating someone that's going, well, I want to be able to share this, but not sure I should. What, what do we think? Should it be shared? And when should it be shared? Uh, well, two questions I'll ask that person. Are they asking about the trauma or the fact of the abuse? Because they are two different things. Mm -hmm. If someone is saying that I have trauma, the question is, has it been dealt with? If it's still described as trauma, then it means the person probably still needs some sort of healing intervention anyway. Now, if it is a fact, if the trauma has been dealt with and it's a fact that, okay, well, this happened, um, it's, it's part of the things that affected me and shaped me, I've gotten over it, it's actually not that much of a big news to share amongst other things that people are afraid of sharing. So the fact that the person is asking this question means it still means something to that person. I would say the person still probably needs to get counseling first before sharing it because sharing it, um, their, their whole self-esteem and a lot of other things will hang on how that um, gentleman or, or lady deals with it. Usually it's probably a, a, um, a lady who's probably asking the, the question. So I would say the person's emotional health is first they should go sort out that trauma mm -hmm. and then it then just becomes a fact mm -hmm. and then if it's a fact and the other person has a problem with it then we then we know there's a problem it shouldn't, it shouldn't be a problem for a guy to say okay well you had trauma well have you been healed from it how did it impact you and you move on from there that would be my thinking mm -hmm. absolutely i would say that i definitely agree as well um, that the trauma is different from the abuse like you said and the trauma definitely needs to be dealt with because it's more the trauma that causes that, that it's more the damage that could cause further damage as opposed to the fact that something happened um there's a there's this saying i think it's probably in my head and i'm probably the one that made it in my head but you can't remain a victim essentially is why i say um as far as long as you remain a victim the only picture you will see is the trauma um this is why i i, I have a, a friend for example dr china who is a psychotherapist and this is something that I've heard her speak about in the past and just basically explaining how if you can deal with the actual wound, let it heal till it becomes a scar. Um, eventually it becomes a battle scar to show someone that, listen, I came through this battle, I survived. Yes, there's a scar. However, it's not a wound anymore. So it cannot be infected again. Um, and at that point where it cannot be infected again, then it's, it's a battle scar. It shows that you're a survivor of something that happened and you can also help others as well who may be coming down that pathway. Um, but then in terms of, of when, and this is the question I'm gonna ask just before we round up, 
when, at what stage in, say, for example, a courtship, because the person that said they're, they're currently dating, um, so in the friendship, the five stages, so the acquaintance, the friendship, um, the friendship stage, the engagement stage, the courtship stage, engagement stage, marriage, at what point in the five stages should the sort of news around the person's history or the things they faced in their past, which of, at which of the stages should it be presented? I would, um, let me take that quickly also. I would think, of course, it depends on how the conversation is progressing because, you know, these things are dynamic. It depends on who is involved in that conversation. It shouldn't exceed the friendship stage. Um, but if I were in those shoes, I'd probably share it as a quintessence stage. If it's, if it's a scar and not a wound, does that make sense? So, but it's the context in which you say, because it's not your badge, it's just a scar. Don't make it a badge, Yeah. Um, so let's say as you start the acquaintance stage where you're sharing information about your person, that should not be a defining badge. You've have talked about so many other things. Maybe when you then get to the point where you're now going deeper at the, at the acquaintance where you're now talking about, okay, what experiences shaped you? How did you grow up? Are there any significant things that happened in your past? Blah, 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 blah. You can also, yeah, this happened, but I've dealt with it. So it depends on how the conversation is flowing, but don't touch it around like a badge and say, hey, here, here, here it is. Now, this person's already dating, so I'll assume they're probably in acquaintance or friendship stage. So it probably may be that sort of time, if that trauma has been dealt with, for them to talk about it. Um, sometimes, really, uh, it's not everything about our past that everybody else will know. That, that's, that's the truth, that telling someone you were abused in the past, except it's, it's shaped your thinking or your person significantly, it may actually not be that significant. Um, sometimes sharing it is just because you're, it's the show, because it comes up in your mind that you trust that person. So sometimes sharing it doesn't, it, it's nothing more than the fact that I'm showing you that, okay, um, this part of me, um, what that happened to me that I wanted to say. So there could be so many different nuances. That some people can go through that and not share it. Um, but most people, you share it because you feel that that's end of connection. But it should not pass the friendship state, because then if it does... And the guy now gets to know at the courtship or the other guy, the thing will be, mm, what other things have happened that you're not telling me? Even though that's, if that's not uh, significant other things, would you naturally hide things from me would be the question in people's mind. So sharing it is just really showing that increasing level of um, trust. You know, um, that, that, that's what I would think. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, would anyone like to add to that? No? Um, yeah, I think um, Pastor Bio pretty much covered it. Um, I would also add um, in terms of the other person's character. So you, you get some people, they have that spirit or predisposition whereby they can handle things like that. And you'd be surprised they could be um, a great counsellor in that moment in time because for a person to actually open up about such a trauma, um, it takes... <laughs> pardon the pun, it takes some balls to do that because, you know, to open up about something like that, it's, you're leaving yourself vulnerable. And so there must be that element of trust in the other person for that person to be contemplating opening up about such a thing. And so, you know, whoever wrote the question, I think that um, I applaud them for actually, you know, putting it out there, one, and also if they're contemplating doing it, um, in terms of what Pastor Bio said, definitely weigh things up. Um, maybe a bit of prayer beforehand might help. Um, but um, I think that it could be a marvellous testimony at the same time um, in terms of actually getting over the trauma as well, actually opening up to somebody you may develop in a relationship with in terms of trust. I think that's really important. So I think I applaud the person who, who actually put it out there because... Uh, yeah, it's not easy because I've had a few um, female friends and male friends that have had abuse, have been abused. Um, and uh, yeah, for them to actually open up about it just amongst friends was a, was a difficulty. But once they did, um, they can overcome it and it, can, it won't be a, um, a, a badge. It will be more scar and something that they can share in terms of how they, how they overcame it spiritually speaking. 
Fantastic. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Can I please ask everyone who's listened so far just to give our speakers um, a virtual round of applause, just a virtual round of applause, please. Um, so tonight, as with every other session, has been loaded. Thank you so much, Pastor Bayo. Thank you, Ni. Nee. Thank you, Sylvester and Mamesi. And um, thank you, Sho. Um, it's been amazing. Um, by God's grace, we will be back next week um with another session i know there are quite a few questions that weren't answered and by god's grace we'll be looking to answer those next tuesday as well so spread the news tell people about it let more people be blessed you can't just keep this to yourself it's selfish don't keep it to yourself let everyone else know about this um and we'll announce who our speakers are for next week coming up